Okay, uh, we're going to get started. I'm sure more people are going to come in, but um, it's a pleasure to have you all here. I'm Saskia Feast with Natural Capital Partners, actually Climate Care and Natural Capital Partners, just recently relaunched and rebranded as Climate Impact Partners. One of the many examples of the uh, maturation of this market, I think, as we consolidate and merge and get ready for the scale. We're here to have a panel discussion about the state and future of the North, uh, of the, uh, North American carbon market, actually the voluntary carbon market. And I have a great panel today. So Amy Ban, who's the head of supply and um, ecosystems at Expansive. So Expansive is the global marketplace for ESG commodities. So we have someone in the infrastructure part of the um, ecosystem. Then we have Lauren Michak, the Director of Program Development at Climco, so a carbon offset project developer. Uh, they'll have some interesting news about a recent investment. And then, of course, Craig Ebert, who is the President of the Climate Action Reserve and who's hosted us all today. Thank you very much for bringing us all together. It's great to be back in person uh, and appreciate the opportunity to host this discussion. Before we dive in, I would like to understand, we would all like to understand a little bit who's in the audience today. So the, are there any project developers in the audience? Please raise your hand. Excellent. Buyers of offsets? People in the infrastructure, so the standards bodies or the standards bodies, let's do the standards bodies and registries. And then lawyers? service providers who are enabling all of these transactions. Thank you. Any major group I've forgotten? I think that's... Probably. NGOs. NGOs, yes. People making sure that we're doing things right. Thank you. Excellent. So thanks for that. I think um, what we would like to do then is first everybody introduce themselves and give a little bit of a personal history about why you're here, how you come to be in this role, and a little bit more about the organization that you work for, and because I just gave you such a brief overview. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Amy first, please. Sure, well, is the mic working? Okay, great. Um, first, just a big thank you to Carr for bringing us together in person. It's so great to see so many colleagues all together off of the 2D Zoom boxes. So just really happy to be here and, and appreciate that. Um, I'm Amy Ban. I'm at Expansive, which is the world's um, largest carbon exchange, uh, along with other ESG commodities. And so my why for that is I want to be involved with um, scaling up solutions as many as possible with a sense of urgency. Uh, I think we're at an amazing time of tremendous growth in the carbon markets. And the opportunity before us is we have so many solutions, but to deploy them at scale is, is the challenge, right? So how do we Flow more capital. How do we integrate all the software together? Um, that's that's sort of where I'm at. My history. I've been in ESG one way or another for over 24 years now. I think I was in a large corporation before this, working in aviation, and had an opportunity to help create the Corsia standard. Served on the initial task force for voluntary carbon markets, um, and a whole bunch of other things in the space and climate. So been in it a long time, and really pleased to be here back together in person with everybody today. Maybe to Lauren. Sure. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also very pleased to be here and uh, seeing everyone in person. Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, funny when you've been talking to people for sometimes three years now, and then you finally meet them in person and realize that they are much taller than you expected, or per <laughs> perhaps in my case, shorter. But <laughs> um, so Climco is a uh, global company that focuses largely on carbon offset project development, though we also have an ESG advisory arm, as well as focus on innovative commodities like our plastic credit program. Um, we have been focused historically in the voluntary market primarily, though we operate in both voluntary and compliance. Um, for a long time, a lot of industrial projects were, were sort of our bread and butter, but just like many companies today, we're also... Um, shifting to focus more into nature-based solutions um, through um, tree replantings across North America with our partner Restore the Earth Foundation, uh, as well as actually we, we just um, announced an, a significant investment in a mangrove project in Indonesia. So that is a bit about Crimeco. Um, I personally, you know, when we talk about why, um, I started out in the zoo and aquarium space, oddly enough, doing kind of animal genetics. I wanted to get closer to the action and address um, climate change a little more directly. And originally I thought that would be through policy. And being in my master's program, learning about policy, I 
became kind of uh, frustrated with the slowness of that fairly quickly and really became passionate about getting really kind of getting my hands dirty with the project development. So at Climco, my role is around the early project development, seeing what makes sense, seeing what works and uh, getting new and, in a, new and innovative ideas off the ground. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, I'm Craig Ebert, president of the Climate Action Reserve. Our mission is to bring the highest quality credits to market to solve this crisis. I've been privileged to work in the climate policy space for over 35 years now, both a variety of public and private sector clients uh, have seen a lot of fits and starts in my time. And I'm hoping that we can finally launch a major aggressive actions across the globe to deal with this crisis. Uh, we failed too often. We no longer have that luxury. Looking forward to speaking with everyone here. Thank you all. I'll just add my why. Um, so I started out as a chemist and I worked on car catalysts for removing NOx and SOx um, and things like that. When I moved to the States, I realized I needed to get some business um, skills. So I looked to do an MBA and I went to Presidio Graduate School. And there I met some uh, crazy people, Jeff Cohen, Tawny Berger, she's somewhere here too, they, and Joe Madden. And they said at the end of that degree program, which was an MBA combining sustainable management and um, normal business was come with us. We're gonna start this company and we're gonna deal with the refrigerants at end of life using carbon finance. And I was like, okay, let's do it. Um, that was my introduction to the carbon markets. There was a protocol that was written that was submitted to CAR and uh, that became, we sold into the voluntary carbon market initially those tons and then into the compliance market, they became part of ARB. So what I have appreciated about this sector is the efficiency and the ability to move things at scale, because that is what is really appealing to me. So as we talk about the state of the voluntary carbon market, it's probably a good idea to um, level set and understand where are we. And for that, I'd like Amy to provide a quick overview of what's happened in the last year, the scale and potential for growth. Sure, happy to do that. So maybe I'll just start with a couple of stats. Um, and I know that True Research is probably here in the room and a lot of my colleagues. So I encourage you to get up in the Q&A later and, and share anything I may miss. But uh, we're at about 1 billion right now in terms of the market um, in the primary market. And the estimates from Trove in particular are probably a couple billion for the secondary markets. We saw about a three- Is that tons or dollars? In, uh, I believe that's in dollars. Where, let's see. Who wants to pipe in on that? <laughs> I think it's dollars. Yeah, we will, we will confirm. Um, we saw about a 300% year over year increase last year in 2020 to 2021. So pretty enormous growth. And I can share within our exchange, we saw about 120 million tons traded, which is about a, over 500 million in dollar value. So really tremendous growth that we're seeing in the market. Um, you know, relative to mature commodity markets still on the smaller side, but the, the trend is absolutely increasing. I thought I would just comment too about the past several weeks. You know, we've seen some pretty severe macroeconomic disruptions due to the geopolitical situation. And I'm really, really pleased to report though that so far in the carbon markets, we have not seen any disruptions. We did have quite a bit of volatility. There was a little bit of offer selling, but actually in March, the markets recovered. We saw our second strongest month of all time. And all of our infrastructure has held up across the sector. So our post-trade services, registry networks, settlement accounts, clearing, all of that has been um, steady, which has not actually been the case in some exchanges and markets. So just really glad to share that with everybody. Other things as far as market updates, you know, I'd just say trends. I think what's interesting right now is we're seeing this um, convergence of a couple of different spaces. So a lot of the, the old carbon policy friends are in the room, right? But we're also seeing banking and financials get really involved as well as the new technology, you know, emerging and alternative type of modality. So, that's a, a really interesting dynamic, I think, that we'll, we'll all be diving into together in the coming months and years and um, sort of sort through how we integrate all of these systems. Thank you. Yeah, uh, from my experience, when I joined this organization that really uh, represents corporates who want to make a carbon neutral claim or achieve net zero or have some aggressive climate commitment, when I started in 2016, the market was a little bit like a kind of sleeping German shepherd. It was lazy, maybe raising a little eye every now and again, really waiting for the demand to come in. And now it's like a puppy, a young husky. It's very excited, full of energy. There's loads and loads of demand. There's lots and lots of capital moving in. There's a question really about where this can be deployed. 
Any other perspectives on the state of the market? Well, we need a pack of dogs now, not just a puppy. <laughs> You know, it's, I, I agree with those assessments. We are at an interesting tipping point and it's uh, been too long coming. Uh, well, I think one of the critical challenges right now is, you know, making sure that we, not too many obstacles are erected that prevents the development of a really vibrant voluntary market. Uh, there's been a tendency for too long for uh, I think ongoing discussions about you know the best pathways and waiting for for governments to 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 uh, agree internationally on what the next steps are that's all critically important. The sad truth it's just happening at too slow of a pace. What we need right now is to unleash the incredible power of the voluntary markets globally. That's where a lot of the capital is. Companies have enormous resources they can draw upon. But we've got to be able to, to unleash that in, in the proper direction. And, and you need to think of it as there's really a like a global marginal abatement cost curve out there of, of, of initially lower cost options, but that curve inevitably will rise. But to the extent that that we put obstacles in the path of that, we're going to delay action, and we're going to make it more costly, and that's simply going to lead to uh, fewer results. So uh, there's a number of steps that, that we can certainly talk about that need to be taken, but I think that goal needs to be recognizing that the, the financial power of the private sector to really make the difference here is what's going to save the planet. So actually on that point, Craig, um, I was wondering if you, as an offset registry and building some of the infrastructure that's required for this market, could talk about things that are required to enable a voluntary carbon market to scale as opposed to the things that might actually be an impediment? Well, there's a lot of discussion that, you know, the current structure, you know, is, is insufficient to, to meet global demand. And, and, and there's a certain validity to that argument. But I'd like to point out that a lot of us have been waiting in the wings for a while. You don't create uh, enormous amounts of supply without that expectation of demand. Now we're finally seeing that demand. I have no doubt that the supply uh, is, is going to come and it will come aggressively. Uh, if we make sure that we minimize those obstacles to investment. Uh, you know, they talk internationally about the $100 billion green fund that, you know, countries are going to contribute to, and that's important, but that's a drop in the bucket. The private sector internationally can raise trillions of dollars uh, and can, if, you know, if unleashed correctly, that's what can make the difference as, as fast as possible. So I think that's the real challenge that we're all collectively facing now. Uh, not that the market can't scale, it's just how do we scale it and how do we scale it quickly and provide those right incentives. One thing that I think um, might be worth hearing your perspectives on is actually what is the voluntary carbon market as compared to the commoditized carbon market or the compliance market or Corsia? So how do these all fit together? Well, I'll, I'll build on what Craig said previously, and I completely agree with him, you know, to mature this and scale it up, we'll need to see more standardization. And that's a word that's thrown around a lot, but what does it mean? And so on the policy side of it, it's things like, you know, taking the task force, the new integrity council now and helping them get to a result that's really practical and implementable, something that can be basically an attribute, a drop-down box. Like when you go to buy a plane ticket and they want your, you know, different data, you can go into a platform such as ours and select it by that label. It, ne it needs to be that you know, feasible versus something that's a 200 page document that you've got to go read through and try to understand, right? We want to get to that sort of state on the policy side, but then also on the transactional side, we need to have more standardization. Our company has been leading and creating benchmark contracts that essentially you're, you're buying, you know, Vera or other, you know, credits that are validated and certified, but under a contract where, you know, the criteria is already set, it's de-risked, it's a simplified process, and it, it gives that assurance to buyers but also we're hearing that a lot of developers actually like it because it, it gives them you know, a little more reliability and credibility in that market too. I'd actually defer to you on that and, and what you're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the standardization can be helpful, but I would also like to note that the standardization, it's helpful on the buy side. On the sell side, it can sometimes create some obstacles, right? Because I think the voluntary market in particular is also a place for innovation. Um, and we need to be able to um, plan ahead into the future, but also react to the fantastic ideas that come through our door today and be able to deploy them quickly and nimbly. And 
while compliance markets, and we talk a little bit about the difference between these markets, right? Compliance markets are set up by the California Air Resources Board and they provide a lot of price certainty. They are also, you know, relatively slow moving and by comparison, it's harder for them to get new methodologies out. It's harder for them to approve new projects. Whereas the voluntary market has the opportunity to really hit those niche areas that need financing today, but probably can't wait for, you know, California to make a new regulation. My perspective is that in, in a perfect world, we'd have a global compliance market and we wouldn't need to talk about a voluntary market, but that's not the world we live in. You know, when I walked out of COP3 in Kyoto, I was naive enough to think it was beginning or the end of this problem. Governments were gonna take it seriously and we'd have an architecture in place where we all knew exactly what was going to be required. Fast forward to 2022, we're not there yet. I hope I'm wrong. I don't believe we're gonna get there anytime soon. So. Eventually, uh, those distinctions between the types of markets uh, need to merge. But for the moment, I think our, our, our greatest hope to address this problem right now is to make sure that we unleash those voluntary forces, as I mentioned, just the sheer amount of capital and the innovation that, that markets can accomplish if they're unencumbered. And I'm not suggesting that we don't insist on high quality actions, quite the contrary. We know how to do that. Frankly, we know what the solution set is. What we have is a global unwillingness to make that investment. So we send the right signals, we applaud the right actions to the extent that someone out there falls short, we steer them in the right direction and we just double down and keep going. Great, I don't disagree with you on that. Um, I would like to just um, ask Lauren to give us maybe a little bit more um, background to the innovation and the possibility for innovation in the voluntary carbon market, maybe with an example of some of the projects that you're developing. Sure. Um, so I unfortunately can't share details for some of our most innovative projects right now, but I think going to discussions from earlier today about what type of credits that, that people should be considering, the avoidance versus the removals, and, and the idea that we actually need to do all of the above. So I, I do think the voluntary market has a really exciting role to come in these sectors that are very hard to abate, sectors that are perhaps underserved or um, ignored by markets historically. And kind of wrapping in innovative technology that's not commercially viable without carbon finance and bringing that money to the table. Um, I also think efficiency in the market could be created pretty rapidly with new technology. So we talk about LIDAR to monitor projects to avoid the long-term costs and liability associated with some of the nature-based solutions projects. Um, I know people talk about blockchain technology a lot. I think that has a certain role. Um, I know that there is another session on that later. I think the role of that will be interesting as it develops, um, but being able to track and monitor um, the credits as they move through the market. Um, I see a little less of a role in that and more of it in the kind of background on, on how we monitor the data and manage it for our projects. I think I'd love it if the other two could jump in on innovation. Mm -hmm. What we see in innovation is not just on the project and the MRV side of the project, but it goes back to these the, the conversations about quality. If you can use technology in order to be able to see what's going on real time in a project, then you are providing transparency. You're able to realize the impact. You might be able to, you know, we can deploy technology to interact with the communities that are being um, improved through the carbon finance that is flowing to them. I think at Climate Week, we worked with one of our um, project developers in Guatemala who is distributing water filters and they had real-time streaming going through the factory and showing how the develop the filters were being built. That's really great if you're buying offsets from that project to actually see what the money is going to, to see how this difference is occurring. So it's not just MRV, but it's maybe about transparency and quality. Yep, absolutely. I can jump in on that one. You know, I, I think about how do I, as an exchange, how do we help enable that growth? Um, I love hearing about the project. It was so fun in the halls yesterday just to hear about, you know, forestry in Nigeria. I mean, all over the globe. It's amazing and it's inspiring. And, and we're here to help basically provide a better toolkit, you know, a better platform for access for folks that maybe are institutional buyers or others that want to be able to have confidence in what they're getting and not have to do all that legwork. I don't know how many were in the last session where Alexia talked about that, but I've also been a corporate offset buyer. and. Um, you know, if it's if there's not a system you can access where it's straightforward, it's you need a large staff to do that, and you don't maybe have a trading desk at a lot of companies. So, 
um, it's, it's pretty critical that we have these type of platforms to do it. Um, I think that a lot of buyers need to have the assurance of what's behind that. And so one of the things in our benchmark contracts we're doing is publishing daily pricing through S&P Platts, which is allowing the market to kind of segment itself. You know, I think governments have tried for a long time to put out a carbon price, but I think now where it's going is really by class. And so we have a Corsia benchmark, we have a forestry one, we'll be building those out more over time with other classes. And my thought on what Lauren said is that as other sort of smaller type of projects or new emerging innovations come out, we can then sort of peg those to the other segments. And I think that's gonna help those institutional buyers and other, other corporates pretty quickly move forward in supporting them in a way that's more credible or, or more, just feels more accessible than maybe we had in the past when it was something new. Love that idea. Yeah. Anything to, to add? Okay, then let's just talk a little bit about, so we're gonna open the floor. I know there were a lot of questions in the last session. Uh, we have very different perspectives on the market here. So we will open the floor for questions. So begin to think about that. And I think there are a couple of microphones. Do people need to come to the front when they have something or just you'll walk around? Okay. Um, so you just touched on uh, the role of exchanges. I mean, we hear transparency, transparency, transparency all the time. How do I get the right information? How do I understand what's going on? So maybe this panel could also just share what your views are. Obviously, transparency in pricing, transparency in volumes traded. You know, how liquid is this market? I think the role of exchanges is important there. The role of registries as well for seeing that type of information. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I'm happy to kick that one off. Um, one of the things we're proudest of at the reserve is our emphasis on transparency. Now, part of that's our legacy. We were originally a creation of the California legislature, where frankly, it was required to do all your deliberations in public. Uh, we're now a, 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 you know, a, a you know, NGO, a nonprofit, but we maintain those same principles, everything that we do, every protocol that we develop, uh, everyone's invited to the table. Uh, everything is recorded, all comments are, are addressed. And uh, if you don't believe me, you can go on our, our website and literally listen to every deliberation we've had on every protocol going back many years. Uh, you know, whether that's exactly the right formula or not can, can be debated, but it is certainly incredibly transparent and, and, and you know, shining that level of, of transparency on the deliberations does a number of things. It, it, certainly should ought to, ought to increase confidence in the outcome. It allows many different types of stakeholders to weigh in on the outcome. And we believe by the time we actually get to the poor, uh, point where our board is asked to approve an offset protocol, that we've got the highest quality standards, people are embracing it, the market's ready to rock and roll for it. There are too many efforts out there where the creation of that credit is too mysterious. Who is the standard bearer? Are there conflicts of interest involved? Those questions have to be addressed. And in the previous session talked about that. There's a lot of those discussions going on internationally, hoping they get, get it right. Um, you know, I think, you know, but it, it's gonna require eternal vigilance on all of our parts to make sure that the, the structure is set up properly. Uh, again, from my you know, vantage point, uh, you know, the buyer, buyers out there, uh, you want that same thing. They wanna know that when they're investing their hard earned corporate capital, that they're doing it for the right reasons. And the last thing I think any C-suite wants around the world is criticism for greenwashing when they're trying to do the right thing. As I said, maybe they stumbled along the way and you may think that, that it was a, a not perfectly aligned effort. Well, work to you know, steer them in the right direction, but uh, there's a tendency in today's market to, uh, uh, I think of it as almost like fighting the last war, that there were uh, you know, mistakes made on, under the CDM framework, but that doesn't mean uh, the lion's share of the credits out there you know, were not of, of, of uh, sufficiently high quality. Uh, you know, you just look at where the renewable technologies are today and you know, how to, you know, from your economics 101, how does any technology uh, innovate and scale? It's because many parties tried out uh, under a variety of different circumstances and that begins to drive down costs. And that's an overly simplistic way of doing it. But the CDM market helped to drive down the costs of solar PV and wind energy. We went from around 2000 claiming, you know, 
credits in the renewable space were not financially additional because the costs were so high, the credits didn't make enough difference to some arguing now that they're, they're anyway tons because those technologies are uh, cost competitive with existing technologies. You can build a new solar PV plant or a wind farm cheaper than it is to operate an existing coal plant in a lot of geographies. That's the opportunity available to us today and the voluntary market has helped deliver that. Now the CDM market is, is a combination of both compliance and, and voluntary users, but that's the type of innovation we, we can unleash because while we've got a lot of the solutions available to us and many of the people in the room, you know, we don't know exactly that pathway, but companies will figure it out. I think it's, it always surprises me that we lose sight of the fact that the carbon market, the voluntary carbon market, it's a mechanism to provide finance for the transition to the low carbon future. And it's for projects that can't otherwise get financed. And like you said, the renewable energy story is probably a great success story because we don't really need carbon offset finance anymore. We've, we've moved it beyond that. When I started at Natural Capital, I think we had 3 billion people on the world in the world um, still cooking a, over an open fire burning biomass. Now that is extremely inefficient. There's a lot of uh, waste products that people, uh, families are inhaling. So there's really bad side effects. I think we're down to 2.6 billion. We still have 2.6. So we have 2.6 billion people to get onto uh, efficient cook stoves, still burning the same fuel, but you know, you can, we can move that market. Other comments? On. I guess I would I would echo um, a lot of Craig's sentiment and also highlight the value of the independent registry as well as having that transparent process because at the end of the day, many of the things we're doing are very new and innovative. Either it's never been done before, we're asking questions that nobody's asked before about what it means to be additional in a certain sector in a certain area. And like you said, it's it's possible things aren't perfect and things don't happen, you know, as we expect going forward. But I think as long as everybody's kept honest with that open and transparent process, it should still become it still it should still be considered a major win for the environment because at the end of the day, I think we're all kind of trying to to uh, steer the boat in the right direction and and row together um, and and we can only do that through kind of an open and honest process. It takes a lot of people to bring a quality credit <laughs> to market. I think that separation of church and state, the separation of a registry, yeah. the uh, open way that methodologies are produced, the contributions of NGOs to make sure that the boundaries of the project and all the things and the other impacts are included is important. Then there's measurement of co-benefits of these projects, like the impact on the SDGs or you know, so other areas. I know that we, when we're working with clients, you have to do footprinting too. So a corporate has to understand their footprint and then decide what they're going to offset. And we've always said we should separate those two because we should not be the organization counting your carbon and then selling you the tons. That's, that's an inherent uh, conflict, could be. <laughs> those co-benefits are critical to a lot of investment in the voluntary market, arguably in the compliance market as well. But you know, one needs to, to pay attention you know, to those. And, and there's a lot of discussion currently in, in the voluntary market that is more focused on uh, you know, making sure that, that corporate action uh, is sufficiently, in my view, sufficiently constrained to, to uh, assure that companies are decarbonizing, which is definitely important. But what's over, often overlooked are, are the other benefits that uh, you know wider applications of, of, of carbon crediting can bring to the table. You know, as as someone who, who's running a, a carbon offset registry, uh, you know, here in California, there's often the perspective that you know uh, environmental justice concerns are getting overlooked. I beg to differ. If you look at the details of it, most of the, the uh, offsets that have been used in California, frankly, have happened in environmental justice communities. Uh, they, you know, maybe not in the urban areas of, of the Bay Area or L.A., but out in the San Joaquin Valley and up in Northern California, you know, uh, whether they're forestry projects or, or landfill, well, you don't have landfill projects here in California or dairy digester projects. Those are, you know, creating major benefits for those communities. And I've often told people, if you don't think that's a major benefit, drive downwind of an uncontrolled uh, cattle operation someday. <laughs> It'll hit you really fast. Uh, and... It, but to broaden that globally, 
you know, carbon finance is an opportunity to reach into the developing world and make sure that they have a sustainable path. Do I wish that governments were standing up and making sure there's sufficient capital for uh, the developing countries to enrich their standard of living in a sustainable way? Certainly. But until then, we have to make sure that the voluntary angle has that uh, opportunity to invest uh, on, on that sustainable pathway around the globe. And I think there's also some synergies in place. Um, somebody was asking a question earlier around when do we shift from mitigation to adaptation, um, which of course the answer is always yes and all of it at the same time. But a lot of these projects also have adaptation um, components. So we think about coastal resilience, coastal restoration, a lot of the nature-based solution work also integrates that co-benefit of adaptation to address the impacts of climate change at the same time as it you know, draws down the CO2 and, and hopefully mitigates it. Just building on that, you know, I fully agree. We've got to be doing all of it. And, mm -hmm. and the same within the different categories of offsets themselves, mm -hmm. right? I, I think sometimes we have heard in recent times a bit of a either or um, mindset around removals versus uh, all the other types. And I think we just have to embrace all of it and also acknowledge there's buyers in every range and price point there too, right? So there may be tech companies that have had a meteoric rise and have really deep pockets and can fund all kinds of amazing, cool, forward-looking research and new type of technology. That's great. Um, but forestry is extremely important as well. And there's a lot of companies that that may be the right fit for them or as part of their portfolio. And so I just would encourage us and I hope to see us all sort of navigate through this time where it's it's not a dichotomy, but it's more of a just doing all of, all of these things at once, both in terms of the function and the category types. I think you make a really good point there, Amy, because what we see in the Every year we've done a, for the past three years, we've done a survey of the global Fortune 500 as kind of a, a benchmark group to see what are their climate commitments and, you know, how is that changing? So I think we saw another 30% growth in commitments last year. When we started, there were no net zero commitments. So it was carbon neutral, RE100, 100% renewable energy, um, maybe, maybe something else, I think. They had an SBTI, so an internal uh, reduction target. And then two years ago, we started to see the advent of net zero coming on. And now we have massive growth there. I think 380% overall growth in commitments to net zero. Now, those are all future targets. Carbon neutrality is generally something that if it is achieved today, you have to have already done the offset and that has to have been delivered. So that's immediate action. And corporates are building their strategy and their programs around what they need to do now, what their internal program is with an SBTI, and also what they have to do in the future. And I think this bifurcation of the offsets with this focus on removals has made it very clear that there aren't enough. And so now the strategy is not just buying tons that can be retired immediately, but beginning to fund and develop new projects that can deliver those removals in the future. So, and that has to fit in with an internal reduction strategy and a communications plan as well. So it's nice to be able to work with them on this. There's a number of aspects of that that are currently be being debated. And I've already mentioned the need to achieve that, to make sure we maintain that global marginal abatement cost curve. What we can't tolerate right now, we simply don't have the luxury of time <laughs> Our restrictions on the type of actions that anybody can be taking, you know, corporates in particular, it all needs to be on the table. Um, there's uh, another issue, it, it fundamentally, that goes to, you know, how do we view voluntary corporate action in the grand scheme of global mitigation efforts? And there's some discussions, without getting too esoteric, around this concept of, of corresponding adjustments, which is almost as if corporate vo voluntary actions are a zero sum game with the host country, that you know, the host country will have to deduct it from their NDC. Uh, we can have a separate discussion about that, uh, you know, but you know, I just think it's, it's the, the thinking is, is incorrect. And, and that type of thinking is not only gonna constrain the market, it will kill it. Because if you go into any, you know, tell any CEO that, Here's what we want to do in the voluntary space. We're going to, you know, drive to net zero. Oh, and oh, by the way, in each of our operating uh, countries, we're going to have to perhaps deal with some compliance obligations after the fact. You know, they're justifiably going to push back and say, "Well, why are we doing anything voluntarily now? If we're going to get hammered in the future." Yeah, it will pause the market. That's one of the barriers I think that we face at the moment.
Yeah, and it's sim similar on the project implementation side. I think, again, there's a comment earlier about companies wanting to be regulated so they have certainty. It's, it's similar in project development, not knowing whether a certain country might have you know, overly onerous requirements on retaining that corresponding adjustment, whether it's going to be required or not. Um, it, it does create a significant amount of uncertainty as well as, um, you know, differences through the market. There's, there's a lot of countries that have a lot of different opinions on the subject. So I, I do think that that aspect creates barriers, um, at least today, and, and hopefully that gets sorted through um, on, on how we do our long-term planning. Agreed. Uh, I would like to open the floor up to some questions. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Craig was talking about the CDM protocol and uh, that some of those projects were quite good, but it feels like um, they're all being lumped in in the same basket as being kind of discounted dustbin credits. Is there any kind of uh, system in place or any, any type of due diligence to make sure that people who did good work in the early stages of this market are being rewarded and not um, unjustly maligned by their contemporaries? Could I, could I ask that you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, to... uh, Mike McClenahan from Standard Renewables. Thank you. The simple answer is yes. Um, you know, under Article Six, you know, we're working towards a, you know, a post CDM world. And one of the fundamental questions is how do we extract all the good that's embedded in the, in the CDM, uh, but improve upon it? Um, you know, I think the the jury's still out on exactly how that's going to work out. But over the next few years, we're going to learn a lot more about that. You know, in terms of of uh, you know the the good actors in, in that space, you know. I, that's sort of a muddled picture uh, because there are just a lot of people who seem to view the CDM as an, an abject failure when, when it really wasn't uh, uh, in so many ways. For, and, and it's definitely generated a lot of great reductions. What we do need to figure out is how to tighten up uh, the ship, so to speak, uh, make sure that we're delivering high quality credits across the board. Uh, and and th that is definitely in play here. Frankly, you know, there's a, I'm not sure if it came up earlier today, I mean, there's a number of efforts trying to define what high you know, quality credits look like, but one of them is the Carbon Credit Quality Initiative. Uh, they should be publishing the results, I think, in the next you know, couple of months. Uh, are they going to get it perfectly right? No, I'm sure they won't, but that's going to keep an ongoing dialogue on how to drive quality in the market. Uh, and hopefully provide uh, very public criteria for uh, buyers out there to say, oh, this one's a higher quality credit and, and, and th that one is not. We need that type of price differentiation. Uh, it's not just a black and white solution, but there's definitely, uh, you know, uh, standards around the highest quality. Uh, and then there's some, some questionable standards out there. And we need that transparency to shine a light on uh, exactly what those differences are. That's coming. Um, We'll have to see what the uptake of it is, but you know that goes back to something I, I said said earlier. I, you know, it, it's you know we can't let perfection be the enemy of the good. If a company honestly thought they were buying some high quality credits, and after the fact somebody says, "No, you blew it," or whatever the, the assessment is, uh, you know, uh, castigating them for you know is just going to uh, cause them to reserve their resources, not invest in mitigation, and we're all going to be worse off for it. So retool our efforts, get it right, and uh, ask them to double down. There's a question right in the back then. I think that also raises uh, vintage to me. You know, there's some questions about old vintage. Should that, I mean, that still is an offset. It's been verified, it's been issued. A project developer has put effort into creating that. Some of the project developers we work with will not do a next verification until they've sold their existing vintage. So you know, the, we have to understand the whole, the whole system here and understand the different projects. Um, it was, oh yeah. A 
asset class and, and vintage with that. When we're talking about transparency and price differentiation, what do you see as the role of vintage in that in defining quality? I can start on that one. Um, I actually, I think Craig is right. I think the market will play a key role in pricing that out. You know, I think if buyers are looking for something that's, you know, very current and they can retire this year, that's going to command a certain price point. And then, you know, the vintages um, maybe in a different bucket. Um, but I think that the previous question asked here, that was a really good point he raised because um, both in carbon and, and other segments I've worked in and commercializing sustainable aviation fuels and um, recycling carbon fiber and different things, it's those early movers who take the risk, right? Before there's a market, they're making the case five, 10, 20 years in advance. They're putting forward that capital investment, the reputations, they're out there in the daily slog. The last thing you want to do is to disincentivize that type of innovation and, and risk-taking of the folks that are really out there doing this environmental you know, project development. So it's, it's really a tough issue, right? You don't want to, we want to keep raising the bar in quality, but I think we all are aligned on, we want to see continuous improvement. We want to see, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and keep it flexible and keep it fluid and keep ratcheting up to borrow a UN term, right? But not to, to close out really good work in the past that's, that's just now coming on market because it takes years to get these projects off the ground. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, from a climate perspective, a difference of, what is it, usually fewer than five years, 10 years tops of, of timeline for when that, um, you know, unit of CO2 would have been emitted. It's, it's not it's not indicative of quality. It's indicative of first movers and early innovation. So I, I think, um, you know, certainly the market will speak to what they want from a vintage perspective. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. It's a free market, but from a quality perspective, I don't think we should be, um, you know, penalizing um, offsets that are only just a few years old. As long as we can keep the demand this high, then there shouldn't be yeah. that old vintage stuff problem. around. I just wanted to add to that. I, I think that question should become moot if it's not already today. It has been an issue in the past with, again, generally age CERs into the CDM. But it, if we're bringing high quality credits to market and we know what those criteria are, the vintage shouldn't matter. In the world we're lived at today, everyone's talking about supply constraints. So uh, if there were any out there, they've probably been snatched up already. But moving forward, uh, everything that comes to market, uh, you know, you know, should be a, a, a sufficient quality. And that's what we have to insist upon. Uh, and uh, as Lauren was saying, if someone's out there just being uh, really aggressive on on bringing credits to market early to make sure that we've got sufficient supply, the fact that it's it's aged a few years shouldn't matter. I'll add one more point on that too. If you think about um, transition to clean energy. If we succeed and we all, you know, achieve the objectives we're, we're tracking towards here, you know, for example, in renewable energy and, and other parts of this, we'll have to rethink some of the criteria we've, we've been you know, relying on for a while, such as additionality, right? If we actually succeed yeah. in making these things majority, the offsetting piece of it won't need to be something extra. It should be the norm in the future, right? So it's, it's just fascinating. In the Integrity Council this week, we've been wrestling with this, talking through how do you quantify it? How, what do you require? And it's just sort of interesting to think through if we actually succeed in what we're trying to do, a lot of that, I wouldn't say is exactly mooted out, but it becomes murkier and potentially harder to account for. But also we need to simplify that and just acknowledge where we're having successes and good works being done and support those good projects. Any other questions? Hi, uh, Haley Armstrong with AJW. Um, we work with a lot of companies that are interested in getting involved in the energy transition. Um, we've recently heard concerns and a little bit of confusion about whether the, the investments that they're making today will be counted in future voluntary market protocols. How do we provide certainty that their investments won't be stranded and that they can get credit for the voluntary markets that they're investing in today? Stranded assets. That's a very broad question, if yeah. I may uh, <laughs> tackle it. Uh, you know, without knowing precisely what type of activities we're talking about, it's hard to address that. But I would urge anyone that if you're making an investment in a, an, what you think is an emission reduction process, process or project of some sort, you need to ask yourself the question, is there a, a protocol out there, a standard against which you're measuring your reductions. Apart from just thinking that you're doing the right thing, it's that level of analytical rigor that says, you know, 
Climate Action Reserve has this protocol. Here's what I'm going to do. It fits within the rubric of their protocol, and I, I should be able to receive accreditation for that. Uh, that's how you make sure that you deliver on the credits. The simple fact that someone's taking action to reduce emissions in and of itself is not necessarily a credible activity. We all do things every day that we hope we do submissions. Maybe we drive less, we invest in energy efficiency. A lot of those things are not you know, creditable from a market perspective. So you've got to take a, a, a rigorous analytical approach to identifying what's the activity that, that you're trying to receive credit for and make sure uh, one of the high quality standards out there uh, you know, is going to back you up on that. We discuss that with uh, potential project developers all the time. I think, thank you. I think there was another question there, over there. <clears throat> and then I'm going to move to wrap up. Afternoon all. Uh, name's Brent Fitzgerald with ACR. So just overhearing this conversation unfold, you know, there have been many opportunities, uh, roadblocks, impediments, you know, it's kind of like the opposite sides of the coin. Do you want to call it a problem or an opportunity? You know, what would y'all say would be top one, two, or maybe three opportunities of growth or biggest hurdles to overcome to see the voluntary market just continue its expansion, either on the supply side, uh, demand side, just anything. I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts. Great question. You've got a minute each. <laughs> um, I can start with just, you know, I think we'll see the market move towards a more mature commodity style market um, as we start to scale up and bringing those tools that are more systematized, more standardized, I think will help scale it um, at a level we haven't seen yet as of today, because there, there are to that earlier question at the point, you don't want to see stranded assets. There are certain things that have to happen to go into, you know, exchange type markets. You've got to have the asset be what it is. It can't change later. Like we can't say two years down the road, never mind. It's actually not in certified credit. Like that's not going to work for a buyer because then what are they going to do with that, right? So I think bringing those more um, mature type of platform and market tools and expectations and requirements to it, along with the stuff that ACR does very well, you know, KYC, AML, right? Like checks on the customers, all these type of things. I think all of that maturation will really help. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I think also you know, thinking about the role of registries and standardizations and certainty in that aspect going forward. So we have, you know, several groups looking into offset integrity right now. We're all sort of waiting for those final um, recommendations to come out to give certainty on what the buyers are going to trust and what they're going to consider the benchmark for high integrity going forward. And then also working with groups like Craig's group to open up the the floodgate of these methodologies and these protocols. So one of the things I also work on a lot at Climco and bother Craig a lot about is new offset methodology work. And I think, you know, there's a lot of good ideas that don't have a standard in place yet. And so I think there's a bottleneck there, but once we're able to move forward and get those standards established, um, that just opens up the floodgate, opens up the door for whole new sectors of, of participants in this, in this market. I agree. I, I, however, I think the supply side is an easily solvable problem. Uh, um, I'm only hesitating because I, we're a small nonprofit and, and frankly, we're uh, resource constrained, but uh, Lauren's exactly right. There's a lot of great ideas out there. Uh, the supply side will scale up. I think the main issue is we have to address uncertainty on the buyer side. We have to convince the buyers that they're spending their, their dollars wisely. Uh, and, you know, I, I worked at, with a number of corporations, had the opportunity to work with a couple of the first companies that declared carbon neutrality, uh, eBay and, and Yahoo. And I've worked with a lot of others that uh, at, once you get up to the, the C-suite are looking at the, the uncertainty and the criticism that are being leveled around corporate action. And whether I agree with it or not is immaterial. Uh, from a, they're trying to defend their shareholder interests and are, aren't going to you know, spend their, their, their capital uh, only to get castigated for it later on. So we have to provide a clear glide path for those investments. So I would like to um, wrap up this panel uh, by asking each of the panelists to give us their prediction of what is the voluntary carbon market is gonna look like three years from now. And you'll be able to say you heard it here first. Um, we had a bold prediction from Randy Lack 
earlier that there's going to be a compliance market. So maybe, Lauren, I could ask you to lead off with your prediction. Oh, sure. Um, so I, I respect Randy a lot. Um, I do have to disagree with him. I, I don't really anticipate a, a at least economy-wide cap and trade or, or compliance market in, in the U.S. at least in the next three years. I, I think we have to operate under the assumption that that's not happening. Um, so what I see is the voluntary market continuing to grow and to lead in that area and hopefully deploy a lot of capital into these sectors that desperately need it to scale up their innovation. I think we're going to see a lot of new players emerge. I am, you know, Climco has been around for a while now, and I, I failed to mention earlier, we actually just closed on a, a really significant equity investment with Warburg Pincus and Heritage. So that's very exciting for us. Um, but I think there's going to be new players in the game that are going to do really great work and, and maybe even standards organizations that can, can help scale with CAR and Vera and some of the other ACR, some of the other really great groups. So I think there's going to be new players, new innovation, and hopefully um, a lot of climate action. Thanks, Lauren. Craig, over to you. I spend a lot of time staring into my cloudy crystal ball. And, and I believe that we're going to have a vibrant, voluntary carbon market in three years. We need it. There's just no way around that, but we have to make the right decisions. Uh, you know, I think we all know them, understand the magnitude of the problem. Uh, my fear is that poor decisions could be made that ultimately could uh, virtually end up, uh, uh, if not seriously hampering, maybe even outright killing the voluntary market for the reasons I've been mentioning today. Okay, so I'm not sure, is that, is that a doom? <laughs> That's in a doom scenario. However, my money's on, on a vibrant, successful voluntary carbon market because we don't have any choice. It's got to be a key component of global action on climate change. That's our mission to drive market solutions to address the climate crisis. We all need to row in that same direction and make it happen. Thank you. Amy. Yeah, and I do agree with Craig on that sort of cautionary tale. We've got to we've got to work together as a community of stakeholders to you know make it practical, make it real. Um, I, I would agree, you know, well, I'm optimistic that we'll see continued growth, you know, probably, you know, higher volumes than even now in the next coming months and years. Um, I think we'll see, to one of the earlier questions around the corporate reporting and alphabet soup of standards, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see a um, streamlining of that and clearer guidance coming out, you know, just hearing from others in the last 24 hours here, SBTI is working on refining what they meant and putting out, uh, you know, new versions, all the other groups are as well. I think that will really help, right, to give corporates a really clear picture of how your offset strategy fits into your broader climate strategy. Um, I think we'll see better interoperability between the compliance and the voluntary markets. I think we'll have to, right, to link all of this to Article 6 and all of that is, whether it's in a tribute tag or whether it's different registries. Um, we're in the middle of that in the software integration, and we have all the technology available today, right? It's how do you link it all together and make it effective? And just cheers and appreciation to everyone out here who does that MRV work because it is hard. <laughs> it, is, it is a slog, right? But people are out there doing it. And it's, it's up to all of us to kind of come together and figure out how to link all of these systems together to make it effective and accessible um, to the markets and to all the participants that want to have access to it. Thanks, Amy. I really appreciate that you brought up the compliance market too, the commodity compliance market. I think when we looked going forward, what would the scenarios be we were looking at? Okay, so the voluntary carbon market kind of sits next to the compliance market. It's an area where innovation and ideas can be tested that can then move into the compliance market, but they rely on each other. So we need the compliance markets to be successful too. So if they fail, then that could have a knock-on effect to the voluntary carbon market as well. And um, yeah, if Great. you would indulge me for a moment to, to add to that, an issue we haven't talked about before. Everyone's holding out the holy grail of getting to net zero, uh, you know, whether it's as a company, as a country, as a, as a, as a globe. Uh, and I, I want to offer that for a lot of parties as an interim goal. Uh, we need to achieve it, no question about it. But when you're looking at concerns over environmental justice, uh, and the need to achieve other sustainable development objectives, simply getting the net zero is, is not sufficient, nor is it necessarily fair. I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples, or at least one. We're here in the state of California, who I think is doing a great job of getting to its net zero target. Uh, we're greening our electrical grid. We're gonna electrify the transportation sector. We've got aggressive policies in place to deal with the other sources of emissions. Yes, we, we know we all need to do it faster. 
but I'm often reminding my uh, fellow citizens that California is proud of the fact that it's got the fifth largest economy in the world. It got there by being the 12th largest emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet. And is it sufficient just for California to get to net zero? Is it sufficient for companies who have been around for a hundred years that have had a huge global footprint? Is it sufficient for them just to get to net zero? I don't think so. I mean, it's a fabulous goal. We need to keep pushing for that. But uh, you know, we can't be sitting here in the developed world and thinking, oh, we've managed to decarbonize. Let's break our arms, clapping ourselves on the back when the fact of the matter is the global carbon budget, uh, fairly distributed, uh, a lot of this is still owed to the rest of the world. And mm -hmm. we're gonna have to support them along that path. That is fundamentally a question of environmental justice and we need to support it. Yeah, I don't think anyone can disagree with that totally. Well, they do, but <laughs> we'll keep moving. Um, with that, I would like to thank Craig, Lauren, and Amy, uh, our wonderful panelists this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.